Welcome back. Now this seems like almost we've been doing it forever, right? But this is my sixth weekly update on the crisis we've been going through. And it's a little telling of the volatility in the previous weeks that last week seemed to be a quiet week because markets moved only 2 to 3% a day. Huge by historical standards, but small relative to the weeks before. And I'm going to follow a familiar script. As in the previous weeks, I'm going to list out what markets did last week, look at the damage in equity markets around the world, broken down by region, broken down by sector, broken down by industry, and see where the damage is greatest. But I'm going to spend some time in this update talking about what I, a topic I'm very fond of, which is the price of risk, something I've come back to over and over again because it centers my thinking. So let's start by looking at what last week delivered to equities. Across the world, it was for the most part a quiet week. If you define a quiet week as a week where markets move only 2 to 3%. The two exceptions were the Nikkei, which dropped about 8%, and India, which dropped about 7.5%. But relative to prior weeks, the week was a quiet one. That said, the damage that was done over the previous month has been substantial in pretty much every market. In fact, the only market which has single-digit losses over the month is Shanghai. If you look at the Treasury market, again, a quiet market. Rates crept up a little bit, but really not much relative to previous weeks. The treasury, Treasuries had a quiet week. So equities had a relatively quiet week. Treasuries had a quiet week. And corporates reflected that. Default spreads edged up a little bit for the higher rating classes and edged down a little bit for the lower rating classes. But overall, not much was happening in the corporate bond market. And finally, if you look at the commodity market, I focused on copper and oil as I have in previous weeks. And as with previous weeks, what oil did kind of broke with the norm. Oil had a very strong week, especially towards the end of the week, as rumors spread that Saudi Arabia and Russia would come to an agreement. Copper had a quiet week. And finally, looking at gold and Bitcoin, as with every other market, it was a relatively quiet week. So in summary, looking across all of the markets, last week was a week where things seemed to settle down. Now, before you heave a sigh of relief and say the crisis is over, this could be the calm before another storm, or it could be a break in the volatility. Only the next few weeks will tell. Now, looking at the equity equities by region, you can look across regions, and every region, again, you see the reflection of what we saw in the indices. The, the markets all showed relatively small losses relative to previous weeks, and you can see that th there was no... There was no market with a double-digit gain or loss, which is unusual given what the previous weeks looked like. But again, if you look since February 14th, the damage has been done. The damage is substantial across all markets. China still remains the standout with the least damage. But note the stories for that. Maybe that the damage started before February 14th. But again, not much change from the previous weeks. Looking across sectors again, consumer staples and healthcare have held up. The sector, though, that did the best last week was a sector that had been pretty, pretty badly punished in the previous weeks, which is energy. The rise in oil prices caused the energy sector to do well. And in fact, its performance last week has removed it from the position of worst performing sector across the last six weeks. And now, in fact, the worst performing sector is financials with a 32.39% loss. And you can see, again, the tilt towards more levered heavy infrastructure sectors losing more cap market value than sectors that are less levered and less infrastructure driven is pretty obvious. Looking at the most of the least damaged industries, the most damaged industries are familiar less. Again, infrastructure companies, many of them with lots of debt, real estate is up there. No, but the best performing sectors last week, many of them were energy sectors. Again, the rise in oil prices brought up the price of energy stocks. Now again, I wouldn't heave a sigh of relief if you're an investor in an energy company because who knows what this week will deliver for oil prices. Finally, I looked at, I broke down equities by classes. Now you're familiar. I broke them down by PE ratio, by momentum classes, and by dividends and buybacks. And I saw very little indication that the dam of systematic differences in damage across the classes. So the stories of high PE stocks and high momentum stocks being punished there's no basis for that. The only classification that seems to make a difference is net debt. Companies with a lot of net debt are, be, are still being punished more than companies with less debt, less net debt. 
So if there's any evidence out there that this is punishment that was long due for people who had written Momentum or bought high growth stocks, the evidence still is not there for that basis. I did add one more classification. I looked at companies that had bond ratings and I have to tell you that this is a subset of my overall sample. My overall sample there are about 37,000 companies, all publicly traded companies with a market cap greater than 5 million. But about 2,200 of these companies have bond ratings from S&P. So I broke companies down by bond rating. And here you see a very strong relationship between the bond rating and the damage done. The lower rated a company is, the greater the damage. Again, this goes along with the fact that debt has become the great differentiator in terms of damage in this particular market crisis. So now let's move on to the price of risk. I've written and, and talked and, and, and worked on the price of risk for a long time. In fact, I have a paper on equity risk premiums that, you, that I will put a link up to that you're welcome to read, but I have to warn you, it's incredibly long, boring, and I fell asleep multiple times while I was writing the paper, but you might find it useful. But in that paper, I list out the determinants of the price of risk. You say, what do you mean determinants? The price of risk is set by the market. In the bond market, in the stock market, in real estate, there is a price of risk. It's demand and supply. But what drives the demand and supply? The first is uncertainty about future economic growth. The more uncertain you feel about future economic growth, the higher your price for risk is going to be. The second is, if there's political stability, it's good for you. But if, if it's if the greater the instability, the greater the price of risk. The more worries you have about catastrophes or disasters, the greater the price of risk. And if that sound hits a familiar, if that if, if that hits a chord for you right now, I, I, I don't blame you. You know, it, the greater the risk aversion on the part of investors, uh, the higher the price of risk. You're saying what drives risk aversion? Well, we know age does. Older investors tend to be more risk averse, but also risk aversion for every investor varies across time. And let's face it, we're all a little more risk averse now than we were eight weeks ago. And finally, accessibility to information and its reliability can drive the price of risk. The less reliable information is and the less accessible it is, the higher the price of risk. The bottom line is if you look at those determinants, they're not fixed over time, which means the price of risk should vary across time. And I'm going somewhere with this thought. The way in which I was taught to estimate the price of risk is to look backwards. It was a very static approach to look at the historical premiums stocks have earned over T-bills or T-bonds over the last 50, 60, 70 years. That strikes me as a terrible way to think about the price of risk because it keeps that number frozen. If I computed the number at the start of 2020, it's still there at that same number now and that doesn't make any sense. So let's talk about a market price for risk, starting with the easier market, the bond market. In the bond market, when investors feel that there's a greater risk of default and they feel more risk averse, you know what they do? They knock down the price of the bond, they push up the interest rate. The interest rate on a bond becomes a very simple proxy for the price of risk. The higher the price of risk, the higher the spread you would demand on a bond relative to something risk-free. So here you know what I've done is to give, it, to give some historical perspectives. I've taken one bond ratings class, BAA, which is equivalent of triple B in S&P. It's an investment grade bond. And I've looked at the default spread on this bond going back to 1960. For the most part, it's pretty stable, right? Except there are spikes. Spikes when? During recessions, when you worry about default. And if you look at 2008, you get the biggest spike of all. So during crises, the bond market price of risk does change. So I decided to take a look at the last crisis, not this one, but the previous one, the 2008 crisis, at what happened to bond market default spread. So here I've broken down four different ratings classes, I'm sorry, different ratings classes across four different dates. The first is the start of 2008. The second is September 12th of 2008, which to me was the official date of that crisis. It was the Friday before Lehman collapsed. And then through the crisis. And you can see that through the crisis, default spreads widened, not just a little, but by a lot. In fact, in many of the ratings classes, the default spreads almost doubled during the crisis. So you think, what's happened during this crisis? Well, I'm ready for you. Here I have the default spreads on triple A, double A, single A, triple B, double B, single B, and triple C and below rated bonds. These are the spreads on Merrill Lynch, um, Merrill Lynch runs these indices based on these ratings classes across the dates from February 14th through, through, today, through actually April 3rd. 
you can see that in the first couple of weeks of the crisis, the bond market seemed to be kind of taking it in stride, doing nothing. And then it woke up to the fact, oh my God, there's a crisis. We could see a lot more defaults and you can see the price of risk rising. Across the board, default spreads have risen. And in fact, they've almost doubled over the last six weeks, very similar to what happened in 2008, reflecting worries both about default and a greater worry about you know, greater risk aversion on the part of investors. So the bond market is reflecting the, the crisis with a higher price for risk. Now with the equity market, it's much more difficult to get a forward-looking estimate of the price of risk. One very simple proxy that can be used is to take the inverse of the P-E ratio. It's called the earnings yield, earnings to price. And some people argue that that number should get higher during the crisis. The only problem is to use trailing 12-month earnings and the earnings themselves are collapsing. It might not capture the crisis effect. There's another proxy that's used, which is the VIX. The VIX is a very neat instrument which trades just on volatility. So it's a, it's a bet on volatility. And if you trace the VIX from February 14th through, through April 3rd, you can see that the VIX has been going a little crazy during this period. In fact, the VIX has reached a, it reached a high of just above 80 on a, you know, April 19th, I'm sorry, March 19th or 20th. So you can see the VIX has been zigzagging and last week and a reflection of the, of the less of volatility, the VIX came down to more manageable levels, but it's still far higher than historic norms. Just to give you a sense of perspective, it was stuck around 15 forever. And now it took off and it's now five times that number at the peak and still three times or four times that number, even after it settled down. But I want a real measure of equity risk premiums. And for those of you familiar with what I've been doing for a while, both on my website and in this blog, I compute a forward-looking risk premium for equities. And here's how I do it. I start by looking at what the index is. So that's an observable number, just like the bond price. And instead of coupons on bonds, I look at expected cash flows on stocks. Now, this is a little trickier because expected cash flows I have to forecast and they're going to be uncertain. Why? Because companies don't have to pay a fixed amount. They, they might pay a dividend and they might buy back stock, but those numbers vary across time. So here's what I do. I take you know, my cash flows from last year, project out in a normal period, what those cash flows will look like in future years by tying it to the growth in earnings. And then at the end of year five, I assume the cash flows will continue to grow at a rate that reflects the growth rate of the economy. And I use the risk-free rate as a proxy. And I solve for an internal rate of return, that discount rate that makes the present value of my cash flows equal to the level of the index. Think of this as an expected return on stocks. I subtract out the risk-free rate, I get an implied equity risk premium. The nice thing about this number is it's dynamic. Every time the index changes, the number will change. In fact, let's take a very simple test. Let's say that nothing changes in your cash flows. The index drops by 10%. What's going to happen? Same cash flows, lower price up front. My internal rate of return is going to go up. My risk premium is going to go up. A market drop increases your risk premium. Actually, the causality probably goes the other way. People demand a higher price for risk. The market drops. If my cash flows drop and my price stays the same, my internal rate of return decreases, my expected return decreases. The tricky thing in a crisis is both the cash flows and the index level drop. But when I compute this on a day-to-day -day basis, as I have during crisis, you're going to see one of the problems I'm going to run into. But before I do that, let me give you some historical perspective on that implied equity risk premium. This is the implied equity risk premium for the U.S. going back to 1960. And you can see it's had zigzag periods in 1970s. It went up, then it had a long bull market where the implied equity risk premium dropped as low as 2%. That's a dot-com boom. Then you see the dot-com bust. And then you see the 2008 spike. You know the lesson I learned? Until 2008, I used to compute these equity risk premiums once a year at the start of the year and use them over the year. Then you got to 2008. And I realized that this number was much more dynamic than I thought it was. This is actually my computation of the implied equity risk premium during the 2008 crisis. You can see it peaking on November, 23rd, on, uh, 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 on November 20th of 2008 at about at close to 8%. At the end of the year, it was down to 6.4%, but that was still substantially above the 4.2% that you started the crisis at. 
that was 2008 at computer the crisis uh, the premium one of the problems i ran into in computing that premium during that period on a day-to-day -day basis i could update the index and the risk-free rate every day that was fresh but the earnings and the cash flows don't get updated that frequently so i'm probably overstating the jump in the risk premium because i'm keeping the cash flows relatively stale and updating the other numbers so I decided to do the same thing in this crisis, but I added on an additional implied equity risk premium. What I allowed in the second approach to do is, as I said, look, we're in a crisis. The earnings and the cash flows might not have changed technically. The, the analysts might not tell me they've changed, but I know they're going to drop because of this crisis. So what I did was I complete, uh, computed what I'm going to call a COVID equity risk premium with a drop in earnings and a recovery later. So I've assumed that in the, during this period, the start of the period, I assumed about a 15% drop in S&P 500 earnings. By the time I got to the last two weeks, that was, the, that was up to 30%. You're saying, how could it change so much? Hey, well, the world changed around me. I got a lot more pessimistic about the effects on earnings. So you see the two numbers. Again, you see the spike, the unadjusted premium, like in, as in 2008, peaked around March 23rd at 7.75%. The unadjusted premium also peaked that day, but at a lower number, closer to 7%. And on April, April 1st of 2020, this premium was 6.01%. Now, again, if you've tracked my equity risk premiums, I compute risk premiums by country. I start with the implied premium for the US and I build up. And again, I do this only twice a year, once at the start and once in the middle of the year. But this year is different. The premiums I computed in January 1st, 2020 are now no longer useful because so much has changed. So I went in and updated the premiums, starting with a 6.01% base, and then also adjusting my premiums for individual countries. And here's why they adjust. The way I get my equity risk premium for individual countries, I start with a default spread for the country based on the sovereign rating. Remember what happened to corporate spreads in, those six, in these last six weeks? They've almost doubled. The same thing has happened to sovereign spreads. So my equity risk premiums for individual countries are now higher, both because I have a higher base number and a higher added premium. So here's my April 1st, 2020 update, and I'm going to put out the spreadsheet if you want to download it and look at it in detail. The green numbers are what the premiums look like on January 1st. The red numbers are my updated premiums. Look at how much they've changed. And here's the irony. They've changed more in emerging markets than in developed markets. And that's, in fact, the nature of a crisis, is the, lead, the most emerging markets get hurt the most. These higher risk premiums are what I plan to use going forward in my valuation. So in conclusion, one of the biggest lessons I learned from the 2008 crisis is don't trust static numbers. Risk premiums are dynamics, which means hurdle rates should be dynamic. And I've never understood companies that compute hurdle rates and stick with them for decades. To me, the expected return on stocks should vary across time and the cost of capital should change over time. And that's it. the end game here, is to come up with numbers that reflect where we are, not where we wish to be. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you found this useful.